Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, TKRM Open Lecture. First, uh, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wandat, the, uh, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this lab. The Termiti Center for AI Research and Education in Medicine, TCARM for short, at the University of Toronto has been made possible by the generous donation of the Termiti family. TCARM is an interdepartmental center that serves as a focal point for collaboration among healthcare providers, trainees, researchers, computer scientists, engineers, and industry. Our goal is to transform health through AI. Just a quick note to all the attendees. Please use the QA function in Zoom to submit your questions for uh, Dr. Verma. He will address, address those questions during the uh, QA session, which is after the presentation. Dr. Verma, welcome. I'm, uh, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Verma. Dr. Verma is a physician, scientist, and assistant professor in general internal medicine at St. Michael's Hospital and the University of Toronto. He's a health service researcher studying and improving hospital care using electronic clinical data. Dr. Verma co-founded and co-leads Gemini 9, which is Canada's largest hospital clinical data a research network and collecting data from more than 30 Ontario hospitals. And in today's talk, uh, Dr. Verma will talk about how Canada can harness big data and AI to improve medicine. All right, Dr. Verma, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Bo. Uh, and it's really a pleasure to be here today with the TKRM community. Um, I'm actually very glad you started today with. Uh, a land acknowledgement, and it spontaneously brought to mind uh, an interaction I had with one of the uh, Indigenous board members of the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, which I'll talk a little bit about today, um, and something that really changed the way I look at data that I'd like to share. I wasn't planning to do this, but I'll share with the community this morning. You know, she told me that one Indigenous perspective on data is that each data element uh, represents an offering, an offering of an individual or a community. It contains a story of a person and it's contributed to a broader data set or to a broader data community with the spirit that it be used to improve something, with the spirit that it be used to improve care, improve quality of life. Uh, and so that we should honor that offering uh, and with you know the respect and and that 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 you would afford to an individual telling their story, and that has really colored the way I look at data. Um, and so I'm I'm grateful that we started with that acknowledgement this morning. We have so much to learn from diverse perspectives and different ways of knowing and understanding the world. So with that said, I'm really excited to uh, share with you a little bit um, of the work that I'm doing in this space, and a talk that I've titled leaning fully into my dad joke side, uh, can fertile soil and green shoots lead to more than just random forests? Uh, or more concretely put, how can Canada harness the potential of AI in medicine? So today our learning objectives are to understand key opportunities and challenges related to implementing AI in medicine in Canada, uh, recognize the, large, the value of large, high-quality data sets to accelerate AI research and deployment. And finally, to describe the importance of human-computer collaboration in AI development and deployment. So to declare my conflicts of interest, I am a part-time employee of Ontario Health. I'm a provincial clinical lead there. I'm also a co-inventor of ChartWatch, which I will be speaking with you about. And as a conse consequence, I have become I'm a, a minority shareholder in uh, the new startup company, Signal One, and I'll, I'll also be talking a little bit about that. I have research funding from various uh, government, nonprofit, and philanthropic organizations. 
So the central question for the talk today is how can Canada harness the potential of AI in medicine? And I think we have to begin with an acknowledgement, with a starting point that Canada has not yet harness the potential of AI in medicine. But what I hope to uh, convince you of by the end of the talk today and share with you is my optimism that we really can. And this is my central thesis. This is my central argument for, I think, how we can harness the power of AI. Uh, some of this is, is intuitive. So we have to begin with data and infrastructure. We need the appropriate communities of users to ask the right questions and find solutions that work using that data and infrastructure. We need test beds and innovative organizations who can implement and test new solutions. And then we need the ability to scale the solutions that work. And so to dive into each of these with a little bit more specificity, when it comes to data and infrastructure, the things we need to consider are first, what is the variety of data that we have access to? Of course, our AI solution development will ultimately be constrained and bounded by the data that we have access to. And so we can't allow ourselves to be limited by the data that exists today. We have to dream what data we need, what data we want in the future and build those solutions so that our solutions will be what we need, what we want, not just what we can measure easily. We need to think hard about data quality it's crucially important that we improve the timeliness of data, and this is a major hurdle in today's healthcare system. We need to think carefully about the representation of who is represented in these data sets, whose perspectives are surfaced when we look at data using our conventional lenses, and what does that mean for the solutions we develop? And then we need to engender a system of robust governance around these data, not only to ensure the privacy of our patients and their families, uh, but also to ensure that uh, data are used ethically, but also in an open way so that people can access the data, so that these data, these stories are honored and used for public benefit. Um, and of course, part of that governance involves recognizing indigenous, indigenous data sovereignty, and that is a very challenging space. When it comes to infrastructure, we have to think about computing power, of course. Um, importantly, we have to think about who can access that computing power, whether it be public or private. We have to think about having enough support in place, professional, skilled personnel, to actually support the productive use of that infrastructure and ensure that that is accessible. We have to ensure, of course, uh, high levels of cybersecurity. And at the core of our challenges in healthcare is interoperability. So moving on to user communities, it's crucially important that the user communities we build when it comes to developing AI solutions is interdisciplinary, that it involves our end users at the very outset. And I'll talk a little bit about this with my specific stories today. It involves clinicians, it involves patients, and then it involves the scientists who have expertise in how to use data, including data scientists, engineers, computer scientists, IT professionals, uh, informatics professionals, uh, and then importantly, a very interdisciplinary set of people to help us use data wisely. So social scientists, humanities, ethicists. The critical challenge with these communities is that they all exist, but they are very siloed. And so we need to bring them together and ensure that they are connected and ensure that their work remains patient-centered. Once we have communities developing solutions that are promising, we then need test beds for implementation. These test beds need institutional support. Individuals cannot implement AI solutions. Those institutions must be resourced. They must have the informatics, IT, software development expertise to actually develop solutions that work. We have to rely on the expertise of our partners in data science for ML ops, for really advancing the field, especially as it relates to healthcare, of all of the things you need to do to ensure an ML model continues to function well and do what you think it's doing in real time. Um, we need to focus on leveraging the skills that have been developed now over decades in healthcare when it comes to implementation science. Those are our quality improvement communities. 
so that when we implement interventions, we have the ability to rapidly refine them to continuously improve them, ensure that uh, they actually work. No intervention in healthcare works the first day it's deployed. Uh, we need a process and skills in end user engagement. Uh, and then crucially, we need the scientific skills to evaluate these initiatives in a rigorous way to make sure that they're actually working and not harming. This implementation expertise cannot be diffused all across the system. It has to be concentrated in centers of excellence because there is so much specialized expertise that's necessary. So you need these test beds of implementation. And then when you have test beds of implementation that can test solutions and demonstrate that they work, then you need the infrastructure to scale. My favorite framework for scaling in healthcare is the Institute for Healthcare Improvements framework for going to full scale. And this, these elements are kind of adapted from that framework. To scale something first, you need the visionary leadership, uh, usually across multiple organizations, to actually want to scale something. You need enabling partnerships. You need a network that will allow the diffusion of, inform of information of innovation. And those partnerships need to be connected by their support systems. So they need to have uh, similarities in their data infrastructure. They need to have the human capacity to implement and scale solutions. Crucially, you need a culture, and I love that the IHI framework says this, you need a culture of urgency and persistence. So you need the urgency to get something off the ground to say, this is a priority, we need to scale this solution and then persistence to ensure that it works because Lord knows scaling is hard. And central to all of that, all of that stuff has to wrap around a core value proposition that your solution provides value to the system, to the individuals. So that's my high level thesis, my proposition for how we are going to you know, harness AI in medicine in Canada. And so I'd like to illustrate some of the green shoots some of the early promising developments we've made along this path uh, with a few stories through the rest of my talk. So let's start with data and infrastructure. The story of data in healthcare and infrastructure in healthcare and in health research in general in Canada is one of slow adoption and fragmented systems. That's not, not news to this community. But a couple of statistics or figures that I find striking. So in 2019, Orion Health did a survey of 150 IT professionals through the Angus Reid Forum. And they asked these professionals from all across Canada, what are the standards you're using? And what we can see is that the industry leading fire standard here in the top right has been adopted by not more than 30% of health organizations in Canada. And, and we're talking, you know, that's probably not even, rep that's a, certainly an overestimate given that these are sort of IT professionals involved in a survey around uh, you know, health information technology. Um, so slow adoption. And if our data systems are not on a common standard, we have real challenges when it comes to trying to learn from the data. In 2021, Canada Health InfoWay uh, administered their national physician survey. And there's good news and bad news here. The good news is that nearly 90% of physicians now use an EMR for at least one core function of clinical activity. The caveat there is that a lot of the core activities of clinical care are not integrated within their EMR. So most EMRs do not have a function for e-prescribing. Most EMRs do not have a function for uh, a patient scheduling and follow-up. So the EMRs while they have now really penetrated the Canadian healthcare system, remain fragmented in how much of the healthcare delivery space they actually serve. The other crucial challenge, which is highlighted here on this slide, is that no single EMR accounts for more than 17% of the market share. So when it comes to trying to learn from these systems or develop solutions for these systems, we have real uphill battles to fight because uh, we have to work across so many disparate systems uh, and so many different data models. So let's talk briefly about 
research infrastructure and digital infrastructure, computing infrastructure in Canada. So the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, uh, some of you probably know and have heard of it, but it's a new agency formed in 2018 with a major investment from the government of Canada to now become the agency that is responsible for research infrastructure all across our country. So uh, the, the Alliance has now, for example, uh, subsumed the Compute Canada Federation among other agencies under its umbrella. I happen to sit, be the vice chair of the Researcher Council for the Digital Alliance. And we wrote this report about what are the uh, digital research infrastructure needs of the Canadian research community. Uh, and one statistic from this report that really sits with me still to this day is that in order for Canada to just get to the average of G7 nations in terms of how much computing power we have in our country, we need to double our computing resources. So right now today, Canada has less than half of the average computing resources for research than the other G7 nations. That is striking as to how much underinvestment exists in our country and how far we have to go. The exciting thing is that it is the job of the Digital Research Alliance to bridge that gap. Okay, so that's our landscape today of data and digital research infrastructure in Canada. Let's rewind almost 10 years now, which is kind of shocking, to a group of plucky young general internists who were getting together in 2014 to ask each other a question. We asked ourselves, what is the quality of medical care delivered on general medical wards in Toronto hospitals? And we asked this question because we were newly in practice there was a lot of discussion in our hospitals uh, about quality of care. And we were starting to, people were asking us to prioritize quality improvement initiatives. And we asked back, well, what are the quality problems? What are the gaps? And it turned out there was no standardized way of measuring quality on our general medical boards. So that's where we started. So uh, on the far left of your picture, there is Fahad Razak, who he and I uh, sort of co-leaded, co-led, co-lead this, uh, this project with our colleagues who we went to medical school with or residency with and who ended up at different hospitals all across Toronto. It's the Toronto advantage, this beauty that we all end up in these different institutions, but we're linked by our training, we're linked by our shared educational experiences. So we reached out to our colleagues and we said, hey, can you measure quality on your general medical ward? How easy is it for you? And we all realized we had the same problem. So we went to our mentors and we said, we want to start measuring quality in general medicine care. How should we do that? And they said, well, you should do what we have always done, what we did with the Canadian uh, Stroke Registry, what we did with the Cardiac Care Network. Uh, you should start with reviewing a small number of patient charts and identifying quality issues. So we put together a plan for manual abstraction of 540 charts from three hospitals to measure the quality of care in general medicine. But something about this, and we were successfully able to get a small grant, a philanthropic grant, um, to, to fund that project. But something about that idea didn't sit right with our millennial brains. Uh, at the same time that we were thinking about that, our colleagues in Toronto uh, were writing in JAMA one of the first papers about big data, which now these observations seem incredibly obvious. At the time, it was exciting enough to be an opinion piece in you know, a premier medical journal. And so they wrote, big data has the potential to transform medical practice. And we thought, are we really going to still take a, a solution from the small data, his, our small data history, and try to apply it? Or, you know, we're young and dumb and at the beginning of our research careers, and we don't know better. Let's try to do this uh, in an ambitious way. So we worked uh, to develop the general medicine inpatient initiative. And so from 2014 to 2017, we worked with seven hospitals in the Toronto area to try to collect this data from their electronic information systems. And it involved, I'm not joking, hundreds of meetings with executives, with uh, clinicians, with IT professionals, with the research ethics boards, with the privacy officers uh, at these hospitals. But we were able to figure it out. 
Uh, and we figured out a way to, uh, by 2017, receive our first data cut of about 240,000 inpatient hospitalizations representing every single general internal medicine patient visit during a five-year time span. The exciting thing about that is we did it with the exact same philanthropic grant that we would have used for 540 patient charts. And so we started using that data and generating insights about quality of care and showing that the data could be informative. And we've been able to grow the network. And so since 2017 to 2022, the General Medicine Inpatient Initiative has turned into the Gemini Data Platform. And the Gemini data platform now involves 30 hospitals who care for about 60% of Ontario's inpatients. And we've now collected data from more than 1.2 million medical and ICU hospitalizations. We've made major investments in a computing platform, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about, so that our data now sit in uh, the HPC for Health cloud-based environment, which is uh, powered for machine learning uh, and we've got some really exciting partners in that space. And data can be accessed remotely by a large community of users. So we now have more than 200 scientists and students who are using the data. Uh, they've published more than 100 papers and presentations. Uh, and it's become Canada's largest hospital data and analytics network. Um, it's uh, got an amazing team that I'm uh, you know, really proud to co-lead. Uh, of more than 30 full-time staff who keep the, the lights on and the business humming. Um, and uh, I use the term business slightly loosely. We are a not-for-profit research organization. We keep things going. Um, and, uh, and it's you know, really exciting. And I think of Gemini where we are now as really being at, you know, we've built something now that's uh, really usable, really useful. And we're just at the beginning of scratching the surface of the potential that we can have in terms of both scientific discovery and impact in the healthcare system. One of the core things that we do at Gemini is focus on data quality because this question was asked to us a thousand times for the first few years that we were developing this project. And we got so sick of hearing it that we decided to brute force answer the question and make it impossible for anyone to question the data quality. So what did we do? We hired uh, international medical graduates, so medical professionals, most of whom are physicians, to go to the hospital and to manually extract data for 23,000 plus data points from more than 7,000 hospital admissions across a whole variety of data types to compare that to the extracted data in general. And what did we find? We found that, we first, we found a bunch of problems. We then developed methods to solve those problems. And we were ultimately able to develop a series of processes by which we now can achieve 98 to 100% accuracy or congruence with what exists in the electronic medical record uh, with our data extraction. Um, and importantly, along the way, we've developed automated processes for identifying data quality issues. So we now have uh, uh, 14 or 15 statistical process control, what we call automated quality control checks in our uh, data pipeline so that Actually, now we don't need to do this in inordinate number of data validate, manual data validation uh, activities. We can actually, every time we get a data cut, it takes a, a frontline uh, clinician or IT professional a couple of hours max to manually validate the data and make us confident that we are maintaining this high level of data quality. So this is, um, you know, an ex exciting uh, advance in development in ensuring high quality data so that people can really trust the quality reporting and the research that comes out of the system. So having built this platform, we realized very exciting opportunities to partner to enable AI in healthcare. And specifically, we developed a formal partnership with, Vector, with the Vector Institute. We're working on three major areas of activity. So the first is something that our team calls Project Quest for reasons I don't understand. Uh, this is all about the Gemini data pipeline. 
about automating our methods for receiving data from hospitals, bringing it into secure environments, automating the uh, data quality control, enabling the validation, enabling de-identification, putting that data into a, a research database. And secondly, standardizing all of this messy, completely unstandardized data to a single common data model. And we are standardizing to the industry standard open, uh, uh, open standard, uh, which is like a large open community called OMOP. Uh, produced by the Odyssey Network. So this is like the core common data model that a lot of clinical data is being used for research. And what makes what is really exciting about this is it makes the uh, data so much more uh, usable and so much more interoperable. And so we're working on this. The second piece, which is really exciting that we're working on is an ML ops partnership. So the Vector Institute has an amazing team of data engineers and data scientists who have developed a pipeline for model evaluation and monitoring to assist with the deployment of ML solutions in, this, in the healthcare environment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about our delirium project. And then the third area of core collaboration is a bunch of research across a wide range of applications and methods of AI with a wide range of Vector Institute scientists. For example, with Bo, we're, we're partnering on a project to predict cardiovascular mortality in hospital using explainable methods in machine learning that he is a pioneer in. At the heart of AI collaboration in medicine is partnerships. We have this foundational partnership with Vector Institute, and we've also developed incredible partnerships across a huge ecosystem uh, in Ontario and beyond, at the University of Toronto, uh, at Schulich, Waterloo, MIT, uh, incredible partners to develop a huge range of AI applications and methods. The exciting part actually of this work, and the exciting part about a platform is that it's really not about any one specific project, but all of these different green shoots or the idea of you know, a thousand flowers blooming. These are the user communities that I talked about, bringing together interdisciplinary folks from the Schwartz Reisman Institute for Technology and Society, lawyers to help us with data governance, uh, ethicists to help with uh, you know, ethical use of, of, these, uh, of these technologies, engineers, computer scientists, the upstream lab is population health researchers who are focused on the social determinants of health. So really exciting uh, interdisciplinary partnerships. I mentioned that we have this large, Gemini has a large student and research community. We currently have 55 approved and active research projects across an enormous range of, uh, of different kinds of research. So health related to health equity, related to care and quality in general internal medicine, a large body of work around COVID-19, around cancer care, disease-specific research, antimicrobial use, uh, and um, uh, a core piece of work around delirium that I want to spend some time talking to you about. So delirium is an acute confusional state that affects 20 to 30 percent of hospitalized patients. When people develop delirium, they have much worse outcomes. They stay in hospital on average for eight days longer. They have twofold increased risk of mortality. They're two and a half times more likely to be placed in a nursing home, and they cost $11,000 more on average to care for. The crazy thing is that up to 40% of delirium cases can be prevented with multi-component programs demonstrated in very high quality randomized control trials. These strategies have not been deployed well in Ontario. It includes resource intensive things like cognitive reorientation and stimulation, sleep enhancement, exercise and mobilization, nutrition and hydration, avoiding harmful medications. These things are really hard to operationalize in a healthcare environment because it takes resources. You need to deploy nurses, physiotherapists, assistants, um, uh, you know, people to actually help do all of these things. And our hospitals, Lord knows, are not designed to provide this kind of care experience. The central problem when you talk to uh, the geriatrics community who have been trying to address this problem for decades is that we can't measure delirium reliably. And if you can't know the scale of the problem, they cannot advocate for the resources necessary to address the problem. Routinely collected healthcare data capture only 25% of delirium cases. 
So this is a perfect opportunity for artificial intelligence, particularly because delirium care has a very specific pattern. When a patient has delirium, healthcare providers order a common set of tests. They provide a certain types of treatments, antipsychotic medications, sedating medications sometimes. Uh, they do certain kinds of imaging and the results of those imaging have certain characteristic patterns. So there is a perfect opportunity to use AI to try to recognize the electronic signature of delirium in a patient's clinical record. So we created, to our knowledge, one of the world's largest delirium data sets, gold standard delirium data sets, where we employed a very resource intensive, like hour long process of chart review to determine whether a patient has delirium or not. It's a validated tool. We did this in 4,000 hospitalizations and we found that delirium affects about 27% of admissions. So this data set then becomes a very rich environment to train ML models to predict the occurrence of delirium. In the process of predicting delirium, we asked a research question. We asked whether involving humans and specifically physicians in the development of ML models could actually improve those models. And this is part of our core belief, which is that the human computer interaction uh, is central to the development of uh, usable and useful ML technologies in healthcare. And sometimes this is called interactive ML in healthcare. Now, a typical interactive ML process for a medical application looks something like this. You start with your data, you develop a machine learning tool, you develop some kind of interface that is the solution, and then you show it to healthcare providers and you get their feedback at that last step. But we know now that does not work and you're really missing out if that's the way you develop a solution. So for our delirium tool, we conceptualize three phases. The first is really the exploration phase acquiring the re requirements of this project. The second is designing your solution. And the third is implementing or evaluating your solution. So these little boxes, without going into the specific details, represent every interaction point between clinicians and the developers. And for us, some of the crucial interaction points here is in the model design phase, specifically in feature derivation and feature selection. We used clinical expertise to say, how should you engineer these inputs into your models and which inputs are crucially important to a model, even if your data mining technique doesn't say so. And so then what we did was we compared the interactive ML models that used physician input for feature selection with models that used only data mining techniques for feature selection. We uh, took our 4,000 patients, which, was, which were over a five-year time period, we segmented the data set into 10 six-month blocks to allow for a training data and then a, help, a holdout test set. Um, within the training data, we used five-fold cross-validation to tune model parameters. I'm going to show you a figure now where we actually varied the holdout data set across these 10 time points to look for the stability of model performance over time. You can look primarily at the final data point if you're interested in kind of a true sort of holdout set evaluation. And we compared three different models, okay? So these plots show the 10 time points on the x-axis, okay, the 10 time segments. Uh, they show different metrics of model performance, so accuracy, precision, recall, specificity, the ROC, and the F1 score. I'm gonna draw your attention to just kind of these boxes in the, in the right over here, precision recall and the F1 score. Um, and we compared three things. So green is the interactive physician expertise model. Orange is the data mining model and blue is a model without data mining. You can kind of ignore that. That's sort of just like a baseline model. Let's compare green and orange. So uh, what you can see is that the green model outperforms orange when it comes to precision or positive predictive value. And importantly, dramatically outperforms orange when it comes to recall sensitivity. If you remember, sensitivity is the core problem with delirium uh, uh, identification tools. Overall, what we found was that integrating human and physician experience into model development improves model performance substantially. You know, we're talking 10 to 20% improvements in model performance, uh, which is really exciting and speaks to the importance of that human computer collaboration.
Ultimately, we found that our, our delirium identification tool results in threefold better case detection than ICD-10 codes alone. And we're now working to develop this model into an identification tool that could be used to measure delirium rates at a, on hospital wards and provide that feedback on an ongoing basis to hospitals so that they can target their delirium prevention strategy. The really exciting thing about this is that the Toronto Academic Health Sciences Network, so a network of the academic hospitals all across the Toronto area, has developed a new quality improvement and patient safety community to use the, and the first demonstration project will be to use the Gemini Delirium Identification Tool to target their prevention efforts so that they can use their resources, deploy their QI, their implementation scientists where they're needed most. And the aim is over the coming few years to actually prevent delirium in our hospitals. And this, if you remember, gets back to my implementation part of the framework that I showed you. Okay, in the last seven minutes here, let's focus on a different set of activities. Uh, the work that I've been doing to harness AI to improve hospital care at St. Michael's Hospital. So we'll start with a case. Uh, I cared for some of these uh, details have been changed to obscure the actual patient information, but any clinician will recognize this. And this is very similar to a patient I cared for. A 73 year old retired banker who was hospitalized with ascending cholangitis, an infection of the biliary tree. He had a, an endoscopic GI procedure to remove a gallstone that was causing the problem. And he was set to go home the next day. But that evening, uh, our team got called. He was very short of breath. We ordered a chest x-ray, we ordered laboratory results, we went home for the night. Overnight, uh, his vital signs were checked only twice. When we showed up the next morning to round on our patients, we got a call saying our patient was severely unwell and in distress. The ICU team was called. The patient did not want ICU and passed away that day. The patient's family was distraught. They said we would never have left his bedside yesterday if we'd have known that he was going to suffer such a severe fate. This is the problem of unrecognized clinical deterioration. Unrecognized clinical deterioration is the number one root cause of unplanned transfer to an intensive care unit, resulting in a failure to rescue patients. So we asked, can we develop an AI tool to help clinicians intervene earlier to provide an early warning signal before patients become seriously ill? We know early warning systems have been deployed in hospitals. So we know about five to 10% of medical inpatients die or require intensive care. We know that these early warning systems have been deployed all around the world, including in more than three quarters of UK hospitals. But we know that most existing early warning systems don't work very well. They're based on historical models with a very small number of inputs. So like log logistic regression points-based systems with like five inputs. They have very high false alarm rates and they recognize rather than predict clinical deterioration. But some solutions have been shown to be highly effective. So the Kaiser Permanente uh, system created an advanced alert monitor. They developed a monitor, a monitoring system that was better than those conventional early warning systems, but still not great. Their solution still has a 90% false alarm rate. But what they did is they, in, they send those alarms to a team of nurses who are remotely monitoring patients across their whole network of hospitals. And they can do this because they're Kaiser and they have a lot of resources. Um, and so those nurses weed out the false alarms and they decide when to escalate care and then they contact the bedside patient nurse and escalate care where it's necessary. They, they deployed this in, intervention in a staggered manner at 19 hospitals and they found a 30 day mortality reduction of about 16% with this solution. Now we can't pay for nurses to sit all day and monitor some alarm system. So we thought, well, maybe we can use AI to develop a better system that has fewer false alarms. So we developed ChartWatch, an AI tool that uses data from the electronic health record to predict unplanned ICU transfers and death in the hospital. Our goals were to reduce mortality in general internal medicine, to improve communication with patients and families, improve coordination between physicians and improve the early delivery of end-of-life care for patients who don't want to go to the ICU. I started this when I was a fellow with Mohammed Mamdani uh, at, in 2017 doing my research fellowship. And we started by consulting patients and families and clinicians about their priorities, physicians, nurses, and administrators. We talked to leading organizations, including the team at Kaiser, teams at Duke and NYU who had implemented similar solutions. 
We developed an AI-based model that uses more than 100 data elements collected in real time from an electronic medical record. We validated this model in real time against 3,000 clinical predictions. We designed a clinical care pathway for what to do with high-risk alerts, and we implemented the solution in September 2020, unfortunately, right in the middle of the pandemic, making our uh, pre-post evaluation incredibly fraught. If only we had predicted in 2017 that there would be a global pandemic. So I talked earlier about the importance of human computer collaboration in model development. What about the importance of human computer collaboration in interpreting the results of the model? So we compared chart watch predictions to 3,000 real-time clinical predictions. This is, to our knowledge, one of the first ever validations to do this. Um, most validations compare a model to some hypothetical simulated version of a patient encounter. So like a dermatologist not seeing a patient but reviewing an image. And that's just not how clinicians operate right? Dermatologists do what they do with a patient in front of them. They look at the image from all different angles, or the, the lesion from all different angles. They talk to the patient. They do whatever voodoo they need to do to make a diagnosis, right? Um, and then they get their clinical gestalt. So when a computer model is trained against, a, compared to a dermatologist reviewing a picture, that's really just not a real validation. So we thought, let's do this in real time. So we asked nurses and physicians which of their patients will die or need ICU in hospital? And we compared that to the model prediction at the same time. So what did we find? We found that, uh, so here you can see uh, in three different outcomes, okay? ICU or death, ICU alone is, ICU or death is white, ICU alone is blue, and death is purple. These are uh, across a bootstrapped sample to get a measure of estimate, the median performance uh, with an interquartile range. Um, around it, okay? So the first box here is the machine learning model. And what you can see is a perform, and sorry, and the y-axis is the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of sensitivity and positive predictive value or precision and recall. So it shows you the balance of model performance, trying to optimize uh, for both sensitivity, detecting a lot of cases, but not having too many false alerts. So ML model here, what you can see is for the outcome of ICU or death, the model achieves human level performance. Uh, that's the first time that's ever been shown, uh, a predictive model achieving human level predictive accuracy. Um, uh, and the model is much better at predicting ICU transfers than clinicians, which is exciting to us because these are the very patients that we believe we might be able to rescue early. The really exciting thing is if you combine the ML model and clinicians, performance improves substantially. And this is exactly what would happen in real practice. So if you combine human and model predictions, uh, you improve the detection of outcomes by 16% compared to clinicians alone, by 24% compared to the model alone, while maintaining false alarms at a clinically acceptable level. We asked our clinicians, how many false alarms would you be willing to tolerate? And they said they'd be willing to tolerate two false alarms for every one true alarm. And we were able to maintain that threshold. So this was very exciting and informed our implementation. The, the important thing is ChartWatch is more than just alert. It, it's a care pathway. It's a whole pathway of what to do um, when you have a high risk patient. So our formal evaluation is underway. Uh, we are studying whether we actually made a difference with all of the fraught limitations of the pre-post evaluation in the middle of the pandemic. But let me share with you a couple of stories. So uh, this came from one of our physicians. It's really impressive. There was a lot of, but how does it know coming from my team? Here's one example. The resident on call overnight received a high-risk alert around 11 p.m. She went and reviewed the chart, saw the patient as the, per the recommended protocol, and he was relatively stable. But approximately two hours later, she received a call that he was decompensating. Because she already had done that full assessment two hours in advance, she quickly escalated care, got the critical care response team, our ICU outreach team involved, and the patient rapidly went to the ICU, but did not have an arrest on the ward, which they thought would have happened if the intervention had been not been done quickly. She feels that ChartWatch made a big impact. Another story. I had a patient who was at the tail end of COVID symptoms. We were getting ready to send her home when she became a high-risk alert, but we had no idea why. Then she started developing oxygen needs, one liter, then two, then three. Turns out she had a pulmonary embolism, a blood clot in her lungs. I'm not sure what it was that tipped off the high alert, but this, uh, you know, 
there must have been subtle clues that we were missing. This last observation is what I think is crucially important. The resident physicians felt that a chart watch high risk alert caused them to pause and think more deeply about a patient. Chart watch does not tell clinicians what to do. It tells them where to focus their attention. And that's crucially important because time and cognitive capacity are the most scarce resources on a medical ward. Here's an example about bias. So a 54 year old man who is homeless and has a history of schizophrenia had a history of recurrent hospitalizations for pneumonia and uh, uh, lung, chronic lung diseases. He had multiple previous admissions resulting in ICU admission. He had never been asked carefully about his values and his wishes. Part of our chart watch intervention is an automated trigger for the involvement of the palliative care team. So palliative care came and saw this patient who they had never been consulted before, possibly for a variety of implicit bias reasons that you might be able to imagine. We know that access to care is not equitable, especially for people with intersectional vulnerability like being homeless and having mental illness. This patient expressed a wish of not wanting to go back to the ICU. And so this time when he deteriorated, he received comprehensive end of life care and passed away peacefully. It's not a life saved, but I think it's an important example of improvement in healthcare outcomes. Finally, it's not all roses. Uh, in this context, the, um, a resident went to speak to the patient after their chart watch alert and asked the patient whether they would want to receive palliative care. This made the patient angry and they did not want to be cared for me again. It made me hesitant to tell patients about chart watch, even though I find it useful. This highlights the important point that we have a lot to learn about how to deploy these solutions, about how to talk to patients about these solutions. And there's really a lot of work to be done at that human computer interface. So ChartWatch is one of the world's first early warning systems in hospital, an amazing educational opportunity, and it's deployed and being evaluated. Uh, let me, the exciting thing here is that um, Signal One is a startup company that is now focused on scaling AI solutions, taking the AI solutions that are being developed at St. Michael's and bringing all of the necessary expertise to make those solutions implementable at other institutions. This is that scale point. Okay, so let me conclude, last slide. This is my central thesis. And through this talk, I've talked to you about how we're building the data and infrastructure, how we're cultivating the user communities how we're building the test beds for implementation and how we're starting to form the partnerships that are required to scale solutions for AI and medicine. I hope that this slide shows you these green shoots. And that's where I'd like to close. I really do believe that fertile soil that we are developing, the green shoots of these projects and partnerships that we are developing are going to lead to a very bright future. And the beautiful thing, the most exciting thing for me giving a talk to this community is that next generation, you students who are there, who are building skills at the interface of AI and clinical care through TCARM. The reason my teams and I are working so hard to build these platforms is so that when you are ready, you will have the platforms to really innovate and harness the power of AI and medicine. I'll close with this thought. It is our generation, your generation's challenge to integrate data, analytics, and advanced computing in medicine to improve the quality and humanism of healthcare so that we can really harness the potential of AI in medicine. Thank you so much uh, for the talk. Happy to take questions. This is my email. Please reach out to me uh, anytime. Maybe I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Emo. That is amazing talk. So while we are waiting for people to input their uh, questions uh, in the chat, uh, I have a very high level question for you. So I know there are lots of challenges in setting up Gemini in the very beginning, but if you have to list one, what, what is the biggest challenge in, in building Gemini? I think the biggest challenge with building Gemini um, honestly was, um, just getting institutional part. Well, so maybe I'll, there's a combined challenge. So one, institutional partnerships and two, funding for infrastructure. So all 
pretty much all research funding apart from the Canada Foundation for Innovation um, is oriented towards projects, toward research projects. So when you say we need to build a data platform that will enable a wide variety of projects, funders are not interested um, and no one wants to build another database. So getting the funding um, and importantly then getting the buy-in and support from all these institutions. And I'll say what I think was crucially important for us was one, luck. I think we came around at the right time where big data was starting, the computing and digital infrastructure was just ready. And we were one of the first projects that actually decided to dive in on it. So now if you go to a, a hospital's IT department, they are overwhelmed with requests, right? So we got in at really just luck at the right time. But then two, what we did was every hospital, we created um, a champion. We had a local lead and we created a junior and a senior lead. The junior was the person who could do all the work and the senior person was the person who could pave the way. Um, and the nice thing about that was that the hospitals saw this as an investment in their own people. It was not, oh, St. Michael's Hospital, Unity Health is doing a thing. It was, we are doing this together. And honestly, this is one of the first collaborative efforts in Toronto, where historically there has not been that much collaboration across our academic hospitals. And I really think it's because we came forward with a crucial clinical question that the clinicians really cared about. What is the quality of general medicine? And then that collaboration highlighting local leadership from each of these hospitals. And so Gemini is not a Unity project. It's really a Toronto and now an Ontario-wide project. Amazing, amazing. All right, we, uh, I see two questions in the QA um, already. So one quick question from Alex is that, what is Canada's computing power look like compared to the median instead of the average? Great question. I don't know, actually. I don't have the data uh, uh, for it. There's only seven countries, but for sure, like maybe the US is a huge outlier in skewing. Uh, the data up. So great question. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, of course, our bias on the digital alliance as we're lobbying the federal government is to, is to make the most compelling case possible to get the most possible funding. Maybe two, I can give you two other statistics that speak to this though. So about two thirds of researchers say they're satisfied with their, of like uh, researchers who use advanced research computing, about two thirds say they're satisfied with their access. So I see that as a huge gap. So one third, and that's of the people who are surveyed. So I think there's, that's the tip of the iceberg um, of researchers do not have sufficient compute capacity to meet their needs. And the second is 60% uh, of researchers say they have sufficient data storage access to meet their needs. So again, I think there are large gaps there, um, uh, which we need urgent and immediate investment. Hmm. Another question from uh, Momesa, very interesting work, which machine learning algorithms were evaluated in the development of chart watch? And did any account for the changes of longitudinal data to predict outcome? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Mamta. Great, great question. Um, so uh, the model that's in deployment is a Mars model that includes both static and time varying covariates. So the model does update over time as it's providing hourly predictions. Um, I don't know if that's what you mean by longitudinal as in within the course of a patient's hospitalization versus longitudinal over time. Some of our features do reflect previous healthcare use as well. The reason we deployed a Mars model, which is a fairly simple statistical learning model, you know, when it comes to it, is actually that the Mars model performed just as well as the deep learning model. So we tried several uh, uh, neural networks, including a GRU model with decay. Um, and uh, uh, interestingly, and I, th I think it's because of two things, maybe one, the nature of the features that we're using. So mostly we're using structured features. We haven't yet incorporated a lot of NLP and using unstructured data into the prediction. So I think there's room to improve that. The second is, um, I think that we're limited in two capacities. One is the data set available at the Unity Health Toronto. So we trained on 20,000 hospitalizations and my guess is probably with a much larger data set, you might be able to see some of the marginal benefits of using deep learning compared to like sort of simpler statistical learning. The third is compute capacity. So we're limited in the, the computing pipeline and servers and, uh, and infrastructure that we have at Unity Health Toronto. Um, and so actually one of the really exciting things about the partnership with Signal One is they are leveraging the layers. So layer six was the previous company that those entrepreneurs had developed. And um, they developed 
a proprietary machine learning stack, um, which allows for really efficient testing of machine learning models and development of machine learning models, which is now owned by TD. And that stack now has been licensed to Unity Health Toronto. So we can use that uh, technology to develop newer models. And what actually they were able to find uh, with what they're calling ChartWatch 2.0, is actually improved model performance, uh, just be it by better hyperparameter tuning because they have a better uh, better capacity to do it. So um, I think it highlights that we've taken a pragmatic approach. I think we've made a step change compared to the previous uh, uh, deployed solutions when it comes to early warning systems, um, but that there's lots of opportunities for improvement. And it actually gets right to the heart of what I was saying about data and infrastructure and partnerships. Mm. There's more questions by Gemini. Um, can we develop machine learning algorithms using the Gemini database and develop predictive scoring uh, system and then compare them with existing scoring systems, uh, for example, designed by physicians to predict certain events and conditions? Yes, please, please use the Gemini database. <laughs> Remotely accessible, very streamlined process. So from project proposal to approval is 12 days on average. Um, and so um, please do, our website is geminimedicine.ca. Send me an email. We want people to use this data set. Awesome. Another question about Gemini. Thanks for the great presentation. Could you actually speak more to the scaling aspect? How do you see some of the tools developed using the Gemini platform uh, expanding beyond just Toronto hospitals? Yeah, thank you. Um, scaling is crucially important. I didn't get to talk about it as much as I would like to. So thanks for the question, although we only have two minutes left. Um, uh, I think that there are a couple of key opportunities for scaling. So for partnerships, which I think is crucially important for scaling, I talked about partnerships with industry. Actually, in our healthcare system, partnerships with the public administrator of healthcare is crucially important. So Gemini has a formal partnership with Ontario Health. Ontario Health has made more than $6 million of investment in Gemini to build a quality improvement network. That network encompasses the same 30 hospitals. Uh, I think this question comes from Rishi at McMaster. He knows about this network. Um, uh, so hospitals all across Ontario are participating in a network where the goal is to take Gemini data and insights and turn it into improvement activities. So that is the network for scale. The barriers are one, real-time data access. So Gemini data are lagged by three to six months. So the current scalable solutions that we can deploy across the network relate more to reporting. That's why the delirium tool is about reporting and directing resources rather than real-time clinical decision support. But I think there's real opportunities for developing a bigger real-time data platform that could support those kinds of decision support. So this is really, I think we have the right partnerships in place. We need investments and we need uh, you know, visionary leadership to take that forward. Great, unfortunately, uh, we're running out of time. We still have a few questions addressed, but uh, I think many are asking about access to Gemini. I think feel free to email MO to, to get more information about how to access Gemini. Um, I want to thank, thank all the audience and also Dr. Arvoma uh, for, for this amazing presentation and uh, Really, really appreciate really a lot of uh, great, great materials and uh, really impressed by the hard work you have put in setting up Gemini. Um, for Thank you so much. Anyone, for anyone who registered for the student meeting uh, directly after this lecture, you can head on uh, over the next session using a different Zoom link. And also please bring your questions to Dr. Rama there. Thanks again for coming everyone. Thank you all for your time.